Hello everyone, welcome to Community Day. I hope you're all having a good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of the day it is for you. I hope it's going great. My name is Danielle and I'm going to be doing arts and crafts with you today. The theme for Community Day this week is Day of the Dead, so we are going to be creating a mask of a sugar skull. Sugar skulls, also in Spanish known as las calaveras, are very important aspects to Day of the Dead as they put them on the ofrendas or altars and they take them to the, the families take them to the cemeteries with them as well. If you don't know what a um, calavera looks like or a sugar skull, it is going to look like this when we're done. Okay, so some of the materials that you'll need to get started are Paper plates, make sure that they're paper and not styrofoam or another material because they'll be harder to work with. So paper plates, some liquid glue, make sure it's not a glue stick because we need to be able to pour our glue down. A pencil, some popsicle sticks, some markers, sequins, loose glitter, some gems, and then of course some scissors. All right, so let's get started. So our first step is going to be taking our paper plate. I recommend doing it on the back, that way it faces in instead of facing out, which would, whichever way you prefer is fine. So we're gonna start by drawing our outline of our skull, that way we can cut it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that here. Make sure that you make it so that it will fit your face. So you don't want to cut from here to here because then that wouldn't fit your face completely. You might want to go a little bit longer, smaller, whatever you'd like to do. This is what my skull looks like all cut out and everything. Chin down here, forehead up here. Yours might look a little bit different and that's okay. Everyone's artwork is going to be unique and beautiful. It's all going to turn out great in the end. All right, now we can move on to our next step. Once we got the outline of our skull all cut out from the paper plate, then we're ready for the next step. Uh, a good idea to have is go going to be a sugar skull to play, displayed next to you on a computer screen, a TV, you could print it out, whatever you'd like to do. That way you have something to reference to. What we need to do is we're gonna be drawing the big details onto our paper. So the eye sockets, the where the cheekbones start, where you can see here that I already saw, started to draw where the bone for the eye socket's going to lay where your eyebrow bone is and then also where your teeth are gonna go right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw those using my reference sitting here. All right, I got mine all drawn up. You can see that I have my big eye sockets here and my little nose here. It looks like kind of like an upside down heart. A lot of other people do them differently though. You could put two little arrow points here. You could make the eye sockets more round. You could make them more oval. You could be shaped like eggs. I also got my eyebrow bone structure to help me frame how to make the eyes. I got my little line for my cheekbones, and then I got my teeth drawn down here. All right, so we got our facial features all mapped out on our little skull. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to be doing our markers now because we don't wanna have to be coloring with our markers when we have like sticky glue and sequins and glitter all over. So we're gonna color in whatever parts of your skull that you wanna color with markers, that's what you'll do now. So for example, to show you what I'll do with mine. I'm going to make something that looks like this. I'm going to color in with black marker and outline my flowers that I wanna do because I wanna do my flowers and glitter. So I'll just color with black marker. And then I'll do yellow marker here, maybe some orange marker, do a couple other designs with markers, and then I'll leave whatever else I want from it as my glitter, my sequins, and my gems. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start coloring that now. I went ahead with the markers and I filled in all the parts that I wanted to color with marker. You can see that I've outlined the eyebrow bone, the cheekbones, I've did some of the teeth, some of the nose, some of the eyes, and then I did some vines with the green and the black as well as some orange parts. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna be doing the loose glitter because when you use loose glitter, we're going to be pouring our glue on, pouring the glitter on and then shaking it off. So you're not gonna to wanna to have to um, lose your sequins or any of your gems that you've put on. So we're gonna go ahead and do some glitter next. Okay. All right, so to start with the glitter and the glue, you're gonna wanna decide where exactly you're gonna put your glitter. So I'm gonna decide that I'm going to put glitter right here. You don't need to use a lot of glue, just a little bit of it. All right, so I'll do one petal so I can show you guys. 
I don't know if you can see. You can see right here how I put the glue on one of my petals. And you don't need a whole lot. You'd want it to be as minimal as possible to be able to stick the glitter on, but be able to dry fast. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick that glitter on so I can show you. All right, so I got my glitter on here. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to tap some of it off onto the table and then it sticks. It's kind of a little bit hard to see against the black. You can see it like that. So you can go ahead and do the rest of the parts that you'd like to do glitter on. I'll show you again how to do, instead of a whole circle, a line and whatnot. All right, now you can see that I've gotten both of my flowers on my eyes done. You can see that little reflection. I'll show you how to do some of the line work with the glue. So what you're gonna do is you're going to take your glue and you're just going to simply start where you want it, get a squeeze it a little tiny bit. You don't wanna squeeze it too hard or else a bunch of glue will come out at once. And you're just gonna go along the line that you want it at. Oop, I squeezed mine a little bit too hard. So I got a lot of glue. All right, so you can see right at the bottom there how I did my line of glue there. That's a little bit much, but that's okay. It'll still be all right. So try to do a little bit less than that. I'll show you my other one. All right, so then you can see how the glitter stuck exactly where I put that line of glue. Whenever you're switching in between glitters, there's going to be a lot of excess glitter that's going to come off of your mask and off of your paper. So whenever you switch in between glitters, a smart idea to do would be to collect the excess glitter and put it back into the can before you switch to another different color of glitter, or just keep the pile separate until you're done and then put them all back into where they're supposed to go. That way you can save the glitter for another time. All right, you can see now that I have gotten all of my glitter put on here. I got the flowers on the eyes. I did some glitter down here. I actually went ahead with the excess glitter that we used that fell on the table. I mixed a little bit of it together and I put it here to just make a different type of glitter. And then I put some glitter up here. And the next thing that we have to do is we have to put on our sequins and our gems. It doesn't matter if you wanna put the sequins on first or the gems on first, whatever you would like to do. I'm going to personally do sequins first. So I will show you how to put the glue on and then put the gem or the sequins on as well. Okay. So determine where you want to put your sequins or your gems and you'll put glue on it. So I'm going to start with the little cross on the forehead right here. All you have to do is just put on a little bit of glue like we have been doing for our glitter. Not too, too much because with sequins especially, there's a little hole in the middle of them. So if you put too much glue down and then you go to put your sequins down, the glue is going to come up through the middle of the hole and it's going to cover up your sequins. It's not going to look the way that you want it to look. And that is what my cross looks like with the sequins. All right. all right, I got all of my sequins put on. You can see that I put some sequins around the edges of the eyes. I did some around here to make some swirls, around the nose. I did it in my heart and my cross. So the next thing I'm going to do is the gems. And we're going to do the same exact thing as we did for the sequins. Just a little bit of glue because or else the glue will pop up around the edges of the sequ or the gems and it will create a little gluey mess. So we are going to go ahead and put our little dots for our glues where we want our gems, and we'll come back. All right, I finally put, finished putting the gems on my mask. I put a little bit down the middle and a little bit around his eye sockets. So we can now move on to the last step. Once you're all finished with your sequins, your glitter, your markers, and your gems, we can add on our popsicle stick to the back. This is what's going to allow you to hold the mask in place and over top of your face. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a little bit of glue and you're just going to slide a little bit right there on the end of the popsicle stick. This will, and then as soon as it's like this, you can take the back of your mask right at the bottom where your chin is and just stick it on just like that. All right, once your popsicle stick is glued and dried to the back of your calavera, we can now use it as a mask.
I hope that you guys enjoyed this fun activity for our Day of the Dead Community Day and you will use your mask and have so much fun with them. Thank you. See you ne in the next video.
Hello, today I will be talking about the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, that is commonly celebrated in Mexico and in other countries in Latin America. The altar is made of different levels. It can vary from two to seven levels. Two levels represent the connection between the earth and the sky. Three levels represent the sky, the earth, and the underworld. The seven levels relates to the seven deadly sins. The altar includes both portraits of our loved ones and also our pets. The fire from the lighted candles symbolize the love for our deceased ones. When the Spanish conquistadors invaded Mexico, there was a cultural diffusion between Aztec and Catholic beliefs. The cross and the saints resemble the Catholic beliefs in the altar. The cross is made of flowers called semplasuchil. The semplasuchil is planted in the months of June and July and is cultivated in the months of October and November. The bright orange colors is known to help guide the dead back to the living world. Throughout the altar, there are also multiple representations of La Catrina. La Catrina has been interpreted and illustrated in multiple ways, even in sugar skulls called calaveritas. It is a way of making fun of and mocking death. Many people dress up as La Catrina in El Día de los Muertos. The papel picado is a representation of the union between life and death. A glass of water is placed in the altar to help feed the thirst of the deceased and also help them gain strength to return. The plate of salt signifies purification. This will prevent the soul from corrupting and it will assure an easier transition back and return the following year. Personal items are displayed throughout the altar. This is a jewelry box made out of carrizo. The carrizo is commonly used by many artisans. Many different objects such as tortilla holders and other items can be made from this material. Another personal item in the altar is an abanico. This abanico is painted and crafted by local artisans. These figures show a couple with traditional clothing. This is a molcajete. The molcajete is typically used to make sauces. On the side of the molcajete, you can see another representation of La Catrina. The next part that composes the altar is called El Banquete. El Banquete is composed of several traditional dishes. In the front of the altar, you can see a pink bread. It is called concha. The sugar ridges make it look like a seashell. This type of bread is sold throughout the whole year. Behind the concha, there is caramelized pumpkin. The caramelized pumpkin is a traditional dish in many regions of Mexico. This is another type of bread called pan de muerto. The pan de muerto is typically only sold during the season of El Día de los Muertos. The ofrenda also has tamales. There are two different types of tamales. The typical tamal is wrapped in corn husk. Tamales can also be wrapped in banana leaves. This concludes the walkthrough of the altar. I hope it was interesting and you learned something new. Thank you for watching.
Hola, my name is Alexis and I'm with the Spanish club at Pitt Greensburg. In this video, we're going to be making some pan de muerto. Pan de muerto, or bread of the dead, is a type of sweet loaf typically baked in Mexico for Dia de los Muertos. Let's get started! For this recipe, you're going to need one stick of butter, one half a cup of milk, one half a cup of water, five and a half cups of flour, two packages of active yeast, one teaspoon of salt, one tablespoon of anise seeds, one half a cup of sugar, two tablespoons of orange extract, the zest of one orange, and four eggs. So the first thing you want to do is melt that stick of butter. Then you're going to mix it with your milk and your water. And in one large mixing bowl, you're going to combine half a cup of flour, your yeast, the salt, the anise, and the sugar. Once you've combined all of those, you're going to pour in your butter mixture, the orange extract, and the zest, and then mix that together once more. And the next step is to mix in your eggs one at a time. The last ingredient you need to add is your flour, which you're going to mix in one cup at a time, making sure it's mixed thoroughly before you add the next one. This works best with an electric mixer, but if you don't have one, doing it by hand works just as fine. So once you've mixed all the ingredients, this is what the dough should look like. And now we're going to turn it out on a floured surface and knead it for about 10 minutes. After you're done kneading the dough, the next step is to cut it into four equal parts. Then you're going to place three of them onto a well-greased baking tray. Cover it loosely with plastic wrap and let it sit for about an hour to an hour and a half or until the dough is doubled in size.
Taking the fourth one, you're going to wrap it in plastic wrap and then put it in the fridge. So while we're waiting for the dough to finish rising, we're going to preheat the oven to 350 degrees. In taking the dough that we put in the fridge, we're going to start making decorations for each loaf. So we're going to need three small pieces of dough that we're going to fashion into spheres. And then we're going to need six long strips of dough, two for each loaf. So once you have your strip, you're going to make three indents, basically making four equal segments of dough, and you're going to want to do this for each strip. So once you've finished making the decorations and the dough is finished rising, you're going to place two strips perpendicular on the top of each loaf. And then you're going to put one sphere in right in the center. And then you're going to do this for each loaf that you have. So once everything is ready, you're going to put it into the oven and let it bake for 25 to 29 minutes. While that's in the oven, we're going to start making some orange glaze to put on top. So you're going to need a third a cup of orange juice a half a cup of sugar, and two tablespoons of orange zest. And we're just going to mix that together over medium heat. So once it's finished baking, you're going to take it out of the oven. And as soon as it's out, you're going to brush the orange glaze on top. I also melted butter that I brushed on top of one of the loaves. And if you want to, you can also put some sugar on top. And that's how you make pan de muerto. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and you feel inspired to try it yourself. Adios!
Today, we will be talking about the sounds of Mexico in honor of El Dia de los Muertos. First, we'll talk about some instruments that are commonly found in Mexican music, and then we'll talk about specific genres played in Mexico and listen to some songs. First, let's start with some instruments. First, we'll look at the guitarron. The guitarron looks like a guitar, but it is actually much larger. It has kind of a hump back and is very deep, and it is a six string bass instrument. It is played by plucking and strumming. It originated in Mexico, but it was actually influenced by a similar bass instrument from Spain, and it is popular in mariachi music. Next, we have a similar instrument, the vihuela mexicana. This one is a five string guitar, also with a humped back. It is also played by plucking or strumming and originated in Mexico. This one was influenced by the original vihuela from Spain, and the Spanish vihuela is a little bit different. It does not have a hump back and it is more similar to a lute. Uh, but the vihuela mexicana is also popular in mariachi music, just like the guitarron. Next we have la marimba. It is a percussion key instrument and it is made out of wood. The keys lay over resonators, so when you hit them with a rubber mallet, it gives you that rich vibrating sound. It originated in Central America from Southern Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, that area. Fun fact is that it's the national instrument of Guatemala, and in American culture, it is used in concert bands and the front ensemble of marching bands. Next, we have an ocarina, kind of an unknown Mexican instrument in the United States. This is a wind instrument. It sounds similar to a recorder. It is definitely in that flute family. It is traditionally made from clay. You play it by blowing into the mouthpiece and then covering the holes on the side. Depending on how large your ocarina is will determine how many finger holes you have, and you cover them to get different pitches. It can be traced all the way back to the Mayas and Aztecs, and similar instruments can be found in other ancient civilizations all over the world. Next, we have the maracas, which are commonly associated with Mexico, but they are actually not a Mexican instrument. But just to start, they are a hollowed out shell with a handle, and inside are traditionally dried seeds, which give it that rattling sound. They are typically played in a pair, and it is very simple to play. You just shake them often along to the beat of the music that you're listening to. They actually originated in Puerto Rico with the Taino people, and also originated through African influence. The exact origins are a little bit fuzzy, but it was most likely a mixture of both. It is popular in many parts of the world, especially in Africa and the Caribbean, and also Mexico. And Fun fact, it used to be used in indigenous ritual dances and healing ceremonies by shamans. And now let's finish up with some important instruments in Mexican music that did not necessarily originate in Latin America. First, we have the flute, the flauta, which is common in folk music. We have the trumpet, la trompeta, which is popular in banda and mariachi music. We have the harp, el arpa which used to be used to play what was called music of the poor, meaning that it was only used by the lower social classes. But over time, the harp rose the social hierarchy in Mexico and now is used in multiple different genres and by every social class. Next, we have the violin, el violin. The violin is used in many different cultures. However, what makes the Mexican style of playing the violin a little bit different is the full bow drawings. And this gives a, a little bit of a stronger, maybe a little bit aggressive sound to it in the music. And it is often paired with the trumpet. Lastly, we have the accordion, el acordeón, which is popular in Norteño music. So now let's actually listen to some of the different types of music you could find in Mexico. First, let's look at mariachi music, which is probably the music most commonly associated with Mexico. 
Mariachi is performed by a small ensemble of mostly string instruments. If you look at that top picture, you can see most of the instruments that we just talked about. The performers traditionally wear a charro suit, which all the men in both pictures on the slide are wearing a charro suit. What you just heard was El Grito Mexicano, which is common in different genres, but definitely known in mariachi music. It is inspired by Son Jalisciense music, which is thought to be the first folk or traditional original music coming out of Mexico after Spanish colonization. If you want to dance to mariachi, you would probably do the zapateado, which is basically just pounding your feet along to the rhythm of the song. And some popular groups and singers are Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan and Pedro Fernandez. The song that we're listening to right now is Son de la Negra by Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan. Next we have ranchera music, which can sometimes be confused with mariachi music because they are similar, but there are some important key differences. Ranchera originated on the ranches in rural Mexico, hence the name. And ranchera is very dramatic. It focuses on themes of love and patriotism. The songs can be performed in a variety of rhythms and styles, so the genre can get very diverse, but what holds it together are those dramatic themes. Some famous singers are Vicente Fernandez and Jose Alfredo Jimenez. The song that we're listening to right now is Cruz de Olvilo by Vicente Fernandez, who is kind of known as the Elvis Presley of Mexico. So if you took notice, ranchera and mariachi were somewhat similar in style, and these next two genres are also going to be very similar, but in very different ways than those first two genres that we talked about. So here we have banda, which originated from German polka music. It came out of the state of Sinaloa in Mexico, where many German Mexicans were living. It is performed with ensembles of percussion, brass, and woodwind instruments. Probably the most important is the brass instruments. It can also have El Grito Mexicano. And some famous bands and people are Banda Sinoloense and Jenny Rivera. The song that we're listening to right now is No Elegí Conocerte by Banda MS de Sergio Lizarraga. <laughs> Next we have Norteño. Norteño originated in northern Mexico along the border of the United States, and it was heavily influenced by German, Czech, and Bohemian immigrants and their music. For example, common instruments are the accordion and tuba. Norteño music is very distinct by its umpapa rhythm, which if you listen to the song here, you can definitely hear that in the drums. And some famous groups are Los Tigres del Norte and Los Tucanes de Tijuana. 
The song that we're listening to right now is Amor Platonico by Los Tucanes de Tijuana. And lastly, we have Dorangense, which is the youngest genre that we are going to talk about. It is popular with the Mexican-American community, so you can find it in some parts of the United States. It is closely related to banda and norteño. You can definitely hear some of the same polka rhythms in it. However, it is a little bit different. It's faster and more modern. Also, they use different instruments. For example, the saxophone, trombone, drums, and especially synthesizers are what sets it apart. It peaked in the 2000s. Like I said, it's somewhat of a recent genre. And some famous groups and singers are El Trono de Mexico and Remy Valenzuela. The song that we're listening to right now is Te Ves Fatal by El Trono de Mexico. What? 